just one minute after one, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon from Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Jenny Kincaid from the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity at CDC. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar in observance of Hispanic Heritage Month, Getting Data Right and Righteous to Improve Hispanic or Latino Health. We are honored to have Dr. Alfonso Rodriguez Lanes as our presenter today. Dr. Rodriguez is an epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Division of Global Migration and Quarantine, and the U.S.-Mexico Unit. Dr. Rodriguez's main responsibilities include acting as a liaison, coordinator, planner, and project lead for Latino migrant health activities for the division across CDC and in collaboration with national and international partners. In that role, he has participated in multiple health studies and leads efforts to enhance public health surveillance of migrant populations and emergency communication with non-English speakers in the U.S. Prior to joining CDC, Dr. Rodriguez was the Senior Epidemiologist for the Office of Border Health at the California Department of Public Health. Dr. Rodriguez received his Ph.D. in Epidemiology and Master's in Preventive Veterinary Medicine from the University of California at Davis and his DVM from the School of Veterinary Medicine in Cordoba, Spain. He has co-authored many peer-reviewed publications and reports on border and migrant health issues. He is also a lecturer on migration and global health issues at the University of California campuses. A few housekeeping items before we jump into his presentation. I just want to let everybody know that all participants are on mute and will be, remain on mute for the duration of the presentation as well as during the Q&A. Please use the Skype chat box for comments and questions. A recording of today's webinar will be posted on CDC's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity website within a couple of weeks. Before we begin the presentation, we would like to ask our participants a couple of quick polling questions. The first question is, what type of agency or organization are you joining us from today? Everyone has a chance to answer that. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question. is how did you hear about this webinar? Okay, thank you. Okay, now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Rodriguez. Well, thank you, and thank you very much to the Office of Minority Health for inviting me to give this presentation in this uh, important uh, month, the Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, and also, I would like to thank all the participants and are attending this, uh, uh, this presentation. Dr. Rodriguez, do you mind um, taking over as the presenter in the Skype? Thank you. Can you see the slides now? Perfectly. Uh, so thank you very much again. And uh, so today I would like to, uh, to present um, the topic of Hispanics and Latinos and data collection. 
Uh, I would like to start first uh, discussing the concept of who is Hispanic or Latino in the U.S. Uh, I will also then provide some uh, background uh, information illustrating the growth and diversity of Hispanics in the U.S., both from the sociodemographic and also from the health characteristics. Then I will discuss how national health monitoring, monitoring systems have adapted to the increase in diversity of the uh, Hispanic population. Uh, what are some of the data collection strategies that have been suggested to further enhance Hispanic data collection? And what are some of the potential benefits of implementing those strategies? And then I will finalize with some discussions, some conclusions, sorry. Uh, this uh, presentation is based on a previously, recently uh, published uh, manuscript. It is referenced at the bottom, and I would like to acknowledge uh, several of my colleagues, CDC colleagues, who either co-authored that paper and or have helped me greatly in, in preparing this uh, presentation. So the first question is, who is Hispanic or Latino in the United States? This is not necessarily very easy to, uh, to answer, but uh, looking at the definition used by the Federal Office of Management and Budget, uh, it defines Hispanic or Latino ethnicity as a person or uh, individuals of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, South or Central American or other Spanish culture or origin, regardless of race. So uh, Hispanic or Latinos may be of any race, you know, whites, uh, African, blacks, uh, Asians, and also may, be, may have been born in the U.S., the U.S. territories, or in another country. For simplicity in this presentation, I'm going to use the term uh, Hispanic throughout the different slides. Now, what are some of the data requirements uh, uh, in terms of ethnicity by U.S. federal uh, agencies? Well, there is a lot of diversity. Federal agencies have different requirements in terms of what ethnicity, race, or other demographic data uh, they collect from the population that they serve. Now, for, for federal agencies that do collect and report ethnicity or Hispanic data, the Office of Management and Budget uh, required that two minimum standard ethnic categories are collected, Hispanic or Latino, and not Hispanic or Latino. Now, it's important to emphasize that these minimum uh, ethnic standard ethnic categories are often misinterpreted as the only permissible reporting categories. But to the contrary, uh, the Office of Management and Budget indicates that additional, more detailed ethnic or Hispanic origin categories, for example, Mexican, Puerto Rican, or Salvadorian, are not only permitted, but are actually encouraged provided that they cannot be aggregated to the standard categories mentioned earlier. The OMB also indicates that respondent self-identification should be facilitated to the greatest extent possible. However, in some data systems or situations, observer identification of ethnicity may be more practical or the only, or, or the only feasible option. In this slide, we can see two examples of how the minimum ethnic categories are collected. Uh, and also the detailed ethnic categories. The one on the left uh, is the minimum ethnic categories collected by the CDC viral uh, surveillance uh, uh, case report or surveillance system. And on the right, we have the, the more detailed ethnic categories collected by the uh, U.S. Census Bureau that includes, as mentioned, uh, subcategories like Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, uh, and others. Now, as we can see in this slide, the, uh, the, 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 the population, the size of the Hispanic population, and also the share of the Hispanics out of the total uh, population in the U.S. has been increasing. In fact, Hispanics are the largest racial ethnic minority uh, in the U.S. Uh, in 2016, there were an estimated 57 million uh, Hispanics residing in the U.S., representing about 18 percent of the U.S. population. This is a significant increase compared to 1960 data where 3% of the U.S. population were Hispanics. It is expected by 2060 about 28% of the U.S. population will be Hispanic. Sorry, I'm getting a message that you might not be seeing my slides. Hi, everyone. We are trying to troubleshoot why people cannot see the slides. Is anybody able to see the slides? 
it looks like some people can, so it's possible it could be a network issue. Thank you. Can you yeah, and uh, can you can you the main office see the slides? Yes, we can see them, and they will be posted on the Office of Minority Health website. Thank you. Just continue for now. Okay. So thank you. So I'm sorry for the problems. Uh, the next slide shows uh, two maps of the distribution of Hispanic populations by by county. Uh, the map in the, in the left uh, indicates that Hispanics are heavily concentrated in some counties in the U.S., particularly in the states of California, Texas, Florida, Colorado, New York. But at the same time, as the map in the right shows, uh, the fastest growing Hispanic counties uh, from 2007 and 2014, in this case, were largely lo located in southern states in other large metropolitan areas across the U.S. Now, Hispanics are not a homogeneous population. They are actually among the most diverse populations in the U.S. Some of the diversity elements uh, that describe, or can use to describe the diversity of the Hispanic populations include country of origin, place or country of birth, language spoken, and culture, among others. Hispanics include individuals who consider themselves Afro-descendants or of indigenous background who may, not, who may only speak an indigenous language and not speak Spanish. Immigration from Latin American countries has been a major driver in the increasing diversity of Hispanics and of the overall U.S. population diversity. All of these diversity elements that I have mentioned are important to be considered because in data collection, uh, in, considered in data collection because they all affect health and access to health care of Hispanics in the U.S. This next slide shows a distribution of the Hispanic by country of origin. We can see that the majority of Hispanics self-identify as being of Mexican origin, about 63%. But also, we can see that Hispanics originate from many other uh, areas in uh, Latin America. The next largest group are Puerto Ricans, followed by Salvadorians uh, and Cubans. This indicates that any statistics on the overall health of Hispanics in the U.S. are, are greatly influenced by the Mexican characteristics of the characteristics of the Mexican population. This next uh, uh, graph is showing the proportion of Hispanics that are foreign-born versus U.S.-born by selected Hispanic origin groups. Foreign-born are defined as persons born outside of the United States, Puerto Rico, or other U.S. territories to parents who are not U.S. citizens. And the column to the left, we can see that the majority, about 65% of all Hispanics in the U.S., are actually U.S.-born, and 35% are foreign-born. However, the percentage of foreign-born varies greatly by Hispanic origin from 60% of Salvadorians being foreign-born to only 2% of Puerto Ricans being foreign-born. Place or country of birth is an important determinant of health for Hispanics because health-related behaviors, access to health care, and health risk and outcomes vary greatly depending on which country individuals Hispanics uh, uh, came from or were born in. Hispanics are also very diverse in terms of language use and English proficiency. Close to three out of four Hispanics, five years or older, speak Spanish at home. At the same time, uh, a majority, 69% of Hispanics report speaking, uh, uh, being proficient in, in, in English. What is important to highlight is that still about 30% of Hispanics in the U.S. report being limited English proficiency, meaning that they speak English less than very well and therefore require access to translation and interpretation services to, re to be able to communicate, particularly in, in health-related issues. We can also see that the, in the graph that the percentage of Hispanics with limited English proficiency varies greatly by place of birth, with 60% of, of foreign-born Hispanics being limited English proficient, while only 11% of the U.S.-born Hispanics are limited English proficient. Citizenship is another important characteristic of Hispanics. 77% uh, of Hispanics in the U.S., the majority, are U.S. citizens, either because they were born in the U.S. or by naturalizations. On the other side, uh, about 23% are non-U.S. citizens uh, uh, and they have many different uh, immigration status categories. Citizenship status is an important uh, variable to consider 
when collecting data among, his, among Hispanics because it affects access to health care and public services. In the next slide, we can see that Hispanics in general experience disparities in, the social in several social determinants of health compared to non-Hispanic white. And as an illustration, if you look first at the percentage of the population with less of, uh, than a high school di diploma, represented by the blue columns in these graphs, we can see that the percentage of Hispanic with less than high school diploma is more than four times compared to non-Hispanic whites. This disparity is even greater for Hispanic foreign born, with close to 50% of Hispanic foreign born having less or completed less than high school diploma in terms of education. In terms of the population, percentage of the population living below poverty level, shown here with the orange uh, columns, we can see that the percentage of, uh, among the Hispanics is about two times higher compared to non-Hispanic whites. Again, uh, the foreign born and, and the US born, in this case, there is no a lot of uh, difference in terms of Hispanics and, and the percentage of living under, under poverty. At the same time, in general, <clears throat> and in spite of the socioeconomic disadvantages that I have mentioned, at its quality, there's a lot of evidence that showing that Hispanics have better, in general, tend to have better health profile for several health indicators. And I have here highlighted several because it's not for all health indicators, compared to non-Hispanic whites and also to other minority groups, even after adjusting for many different socioeconomic status and uh, 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 variables. At the same time, Hispanics experience several uh, severe disparities for other health issues. Again, it's very important to highlight that there are big differences among uh, Hispanic uh, subgroups in terms of the health status and indicators. This diversity in health outcomes, in the next slide, is defined by the same variable that we have been discussing. Country of origin, place, country of birth, citizenship, language, race, years in the United States and others. And all of these variables are very important because they interact with each other and all of them affect also independently the health and access to health uh, care among Hispanics in the U.S. In the next slide, we have an illustration of one of the positive indicators of health advantages for Hispanics. We can see that it's looking at life expectancy at birth by selected uh, race and ethnic categories. And we can see that Hispanics, uh, both U.S. born and foreign born, have a longer life expectancy at birth compared to both uh, blacks and also to non-Hispanic non black, non-Hispanic white, sorry. And uh, we also see that the foreign-born Hispanics actually have the greatest advantage in terms of life expectancy of birth. This is why it's considered that a lot of the Hispanic uh, advantage parad paradox uh, is related to the good health of foreign-born Hispanics and uh, a, good, a better indicator of foreign-born Hispanics uh, uh, in the U.S. Next slide. On the other side, and again, this is not an event to, show, to, to provide a, a comprehensive review of the health of Hispanics, but just to illustrate that even though there are advantages, there are also very, very severe dispar disparities of Hispanics compared to non-Hispanic whites. And this is just one example in terms of health insurance coverage. We can see in this slide that in general, for all Hispanic groups, they tend to have significantly lower health insurance coverage compared to non-Hispanic uh, whites. But we also see uh, here very well illustrated the importance of collecting detailed uh, Hispanic origin and, and, and also place of birth information. We can see that among Hispanics, Mexican-born Hispanics have the greatest uh, disparities in terms of uh, health insurance, while on the other side, uh, you know, Puerto Rican uh, born in the U.S. and Cuban born in the U.S. have better uh, insurance coverage compared to, uh, to other Hispanic populations. Hispanics also experience uh, other disparities, not only health insurance, but also in terms of uh, screening, health screening, and access to, to treatment and, and, and infectious diseases. So, how have the national population health monitoring data systems adapted to this increasing Hispanic uh, diversity? As you know, in the U.S., there are multiple national data systems with the responsibility of monitoring the health of U.S. populations. They include population surveys, vital statistics, disease registr re registries, and public health surveillance systems. Many of those data systems are also 
used to identify populations experiencing disparities, health disparities, and uh, in order to develop policies and programs to uh, address them. So I'm going to review some of the, in, in, a, in, a, in a few uh, follow-up slides, there have been a number of uh, successful initiatives and, and, and uh, uh, strategies implemented ac and across the health uh, national health monitoring data systems in the U.S. to improve data collection. But also, there have been a lot of, uh, of reports uh, indicating there are important gaps uh, remain in the availability, quality, and comparability of data in national data systems that are needed to monitor Hispanics in other minority health. Some of those gaps and limitations uh, include limitations in the collection and reporting of Hispanic diversity data elements, such as detailed ethnic categories, language, and place of birth primarily, and also barriers to participation by individuals with limited English proficiency uh, living in the U.S. So what are some of the strategies? What can be done in terms of enhancing data collection given the increase in diversity of Hispanics in, in the U.S. There have been uh, many multiple reports and publications from multiple organizations, advisory groups, and, re and researchers that have been providing similar uh, recommendations in terms of the strategies that could be implemented to enhance data collection for diverse Hispanic uh, populations. I'm going to review some of those uh, suggested the strategies. They include first enhancing collection, analysis, and reporting of standardized Hispanic diversity data elements. First, detailed racial and ethnic categories, for example, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Salvadorian, etc. Et Language spoken at home and English speaking proficiency, and also detailed place and country of birth, including uh, people born in U.S. territories. So additional suggested uh, data, diversity uh, data elements are being suggested include citizenship, years in the United States for the foreign born, and all of the mentioned variables uh, to be collected for parents for systems or data systems that collect data on the health of children in the U.S. There are some good examples of federal standards and initiatives in terms of uh, implementing some of the suggested strategies, they include the DHHS data standards for race, ethnicity, and language that were published in 2011, and they include the standard for detailed uh, ethnic uh, uh, category. Even though the current standards only apply to population surveys at this moment, and, and they are suggested to be implemented to the extent uh, practical, uh, I believe that they can be used as examples by other data systems. In terms of data or standard for place of birth, citizenship, and years in the United States, have been suggested to use the U.S. Census Bureau because they collect uh, validated or they use validated uh, questions to collect this information, and, and also because by using the standards uh, developed by the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, that information can be used for denominators of the data that we collect. The second uh, suggested strategy, uh, besides expanding the data elements, is to promote the culturally and linguistically appropriate data uh, collection. That includes, first, the translation and cultural validation of data collection instruments, and secondly, providing interpreters for limited English proficient uh, uh, individuals. We are aware that there are hundreds of languages being spoken in the U.S. by people who are limited English proficient. Uh, but there is a potential to prioritize some of the languages that could be translated, that the data collection instruments can be translated into. Uh, cultural validation of the instrument is very important, uh, and not just to do direct uh, translation, because particularly for Hispanics, because of the lower educational attainment and also for lower uh, uh, literacy, and for the different uh, cultural meaning that uh, number of terms in health and concepts in health may have for different uh, cultural populations for Hispanics compared to non-Hispanic populations. It's also important uh, to know that it's strongly discouraged to use non-trained individuals, such as family members, to, uh, uh, to do interpreting uh, for people participating or for people who are being, information is being collected from, uh, from them. 
There are also uh, new and exciting translation interpretation technologies, for example, trans machine translation and phone line interpretation that can be used to address some of the gaps, some of the barriers, and uh, participation by limited English proficient Hispanics and data collection activities. Again, there are also some good examples of federal guidance. Here we have three of them from the HHS, the National Standard for Cultural and Linguistic Appropriate Services, the HHS Language Access Plan, and the Diverse Voices uh, documents. All of these three documents emphasize the importance of offering adequate language services to individuals with limited English proficiency and providing reading translations of key documents. They are all voluntary uh, programs, so they are not requirements of uh, this guidance. But uh, we believe that by implementing, by, by, by continuing the implementation of, the, of these uh, guidance documents, again, the barriers to participation by limited English proficient uh, population will be uh, improved. Now, at the same time that we are, I'm discussing these uh, suggested strategies to improve the data collection among Hispanics, we're also aware that there are many challenges to making any changes to our national data collection systems. The, some of these barriers include the need for a, the, the potential need for additional resources, both financial and personnel. Uh, there are costs associated with making changes to databases and protocols, training data collectors. In some cases, laws and regulations and data collections are under the authority of state and local jurisdictions or other stakeholders. And there might also be concerns about confidentiality. So this is why uh, we're proposing one of the approaches is for national health monitoring data systems to review, uh, to continue review and develop initiatives and assess the feasibility of implementing those uh, suggested strategies based on their specific information needs, the area of public health focus, uh, their affected populations, if particularly they include a high proportion of limited English proficient uh, populations, who is collecting the data, if the data is collected directly from individuals or from secondary uh, sources, uh, what are the current and historic data collection practices, uh, are there logistic and technological barriers, and finally, available uh, resources. It is likely that the suggested strategies might be, will be more feasible to be implemented and with more intensity and urgency by certain, some data systems compared to others. However, as we will discuss in a moment, we believe that the benefits of making those changes uh, can also outweigh the costs. There are also many examples, and this is only some, a few of them, of national data systems that have been implementing or have been implemented for a number of years. They suggested a strategy discussed in this, uh, in this presentation. For example, in 2014, the National Notified Disease Surveillance System that uh, monitors more than 100 notifiable diseases across the US uh, added country of birth as a core demographic variables for all those uh, uh, conditions. The CDC HIV surveillance system collects detailed country of birth and extended race of ethnicity information. In also in recent years, the CDC Listeria initiative added detailed race of ethnicity, country of birth, and language, as well as made their questionnaire available in Spanish. The National Immunization Survey and many other national surveys provide interpreters in many languages uh, available to, again, limited English particip participants. Now, I mentioned some of the barriers, some of the costs, uh, but I want to highlight now what are some of the potential benefits for data systems and for public health in general uh, uh, for implementing some of the suggested uh, strategies. And I would like to look at the potential benefits from three different perspectives. First, from, the, from a scientific perspective, then programmatic, and finally, uh, the one that probably there is less attention paid to the ethical uh, benefits of implementing the suggested strategies. First, in terms of the potential scientific uh, uh, benefits, there is uh, evidence that providing language access increases participation rates in health surveys specifically, and also participants are more likely to be representative of the target population. For example, there is evidence that if only English-speaking Hispanics participate in a survey or in a data collection uh, uh, system, they are more likely to be US-born, more like or more likely to be acculturated, more educated, and also more likely to have higher income and better access to care than the overall Hispanic populations. Therefore, the findings from that data collection or survey 
are uh, may not be representative of the overall Hispanic population. Information collected from Hispanic with limited English proficiency is also likely to be of better quality and more complete if an interpreter is provided and if data is only collected in English. So even if they speak English, as I mentioned before, if they are, uh, their, their English uh, proficiency is not very good, uh, the responses might, might not be no, very accurate or the collection of the information might not be very, very accurate. By implementing the suggested strategies, programs may have an increased ability to identify the varying health risks, especially emerging ones, and health disparities affecting Hispanic subpopulations. And as an illustration, this is a graph showing the current cigarette smoking as a percentage by selected racial ethnic categories in the U.S. We can see that Hispanics in blue, about 14% of Hispanics uh, in 2013 reported that they smoke cigarettes. And we can see that the proportion is much smaller compared to particularly American Indian, Alaska Natives, and blacks, non Hispanic blacks, whites, and non Hispanics. However, if we disaggregate the cigarette smoking data by Hispanic origin and by place of birth, we again can see that there is a tremendous diversity among Hispanic populations. And now we can observe that Puerto Ricans and also Cuban born uh, in the U.S. have actually as high or higher percentage of cigarette smokers compared to uh, non-Hispanic whites. But at the same time, foreign-born, uh, uh, on the other side, foreign-born Central Americans and uh, Mexicans have a relatively or much lower percentage of current uh, smokers. So diversity and the, this health, very, very important health behavior, but also important in terms of developing educational materials and targeting these different uh, uh, Hispanic groups with different uh, uh, smoking uh, information depending on the risk of uh, being current smokers, so different risks of being a smoker not currently in the U.S. Now, in terms of potential programmatic benefits, uh, there is uh, evidence that by implementing some of the suggested strategies, uh, programs we have an increased ability to design culturally and linguistically appropriate uh, uh, interventions. Uh, and this is by understanding a little bit more some of the characteristics like national origin, race, language, etc., that define uh, the, 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 the characteristics of, and the needs, the communication needs of those uh, uh, populations. Also, more detailed information about subpopulations, a higher risk or varying risk for a health condition can be used by programs to develop more effective public health interventions, both universal and targeted, and also for more effective use of resources. For example, in this graph that we have here, showing uh, demographics of travel associated Zika cases uh, in San Diego County, comparing Zika case patients, uh, the proportion of Zika case patients by uh, Hispanic ethnicity and foreign birth, compared to the overall or the underlying county population. This is data from 2016 to 2017, uh, keeping in mind that it's a relatively small sample size, 78 cases in total. But still, it's very, very telling. Uh, uh, by analyzing the data at the county, they were able to identify that the, a disproportionate number of, a proportion of uh, uh, Hispanics, of the, sorry, of Zika case patients were Hispanics. 54% compared to only 33% of the population being Hispanics. The majority of the Hispanic cases were uh, people of Mexican origin. Also, a uh, disproportionate uh, number of uh, the foreign-born population in the county uh, were uh, among the Zika case patients, 33% compared to 23% of the population. Again, the majority were born uh, in Mexico. This allowed the county to not only develop uh, communication and uh, enhance surveillance for the overall uh, travel uh, population in the county, resident county uh, population, but also to implement uh, specific uh, strategies targeting uh, the Hispanics and born and born populations in the county with messages about preventing Zika. Uh, important to know that even though it's, uh, this information is collected, similar national level data has not currently up to, the, up to today published uh, in the U.S. Now we talk about scientific, we talk about program, potential programmatic benefits, uh, but it's very important also to highlight some sort of the potential ethical benefits 
of implementing the suggested strategies. And we can highlight two potential benefits. One is by implementing those strategies, we can better ensure fair inclusion of subpopulations in data collection and also in distribution of public health services and resources. Second, in public health, we also have a responsibility to prioritize public health interventions to those with the highest disease burden of fewer uh, resources. So the question is if the data systems, if our national data systems do not collect uh, adequate and disaggregated data for participants in terms of Hispanic uh, diversity, how can we confirm that the diverse Hispanic subpopulation have a fair opportunity to be included in data collection of program services? Also, if data are collected only in English, how can we ensure that all Hispanics have equitable opportunity to participate in data collection and that their needs will be identified given the high percent of Hispanics with limited proficiency? As you remember from the beginning of the presentation, about 30% of Hispanics in the U.S. are limited English proficient. That proportion is even higher among adults. And actually, the limited English proficient population among Hispanics tend to be some of the most vulnerable population, the elderly, people with lower education, more likely to be poor, and more likely to have barriers to access to health care. Now, at the same time that we are emphasizing the importance of enhancing data, the diversity data elements collected, uh, uh, among Hispanics in, uh, in the U.S., it's also very important to keep in mind the, 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 the need to protect uh, data collected from disadvantaged and vulnerable populations in data. And again, this is something that uh, across the federal agencies there are strict uh, uh, guidance and, and, and norms about protecting data confidentiality and privacy, also respecting autonomy and uh, informed consent as appropriate when collecting data. Uh, making sure that data is collected primarily to benefit the community. And finally, that when data is collected and reported to prevent further stigmatization of potentially a population who are already uh, very vulnerable. In conclusion, Hispanics are an increasing share of the U.S. population and also a very heterogeneous popu uh, uh, population in terms of socio-demographics socio and health characteristics. I have presented numerous rationales, and there is a lot of reports and evidence in terms of rationales for um, enhancing the collection or for collecting the recommended data elements and providing language access. Those rationales include scientific, programmatic, and ethical uh, principles. There are also good resources available and many examples of good practices in the expanded data collection across the federal agencies. Finally, expanded data collection may improve the quality of data needed to monitor and address Hispanic and also other minority population health. Even though in this presentation I've been focusing on Hispanics, I want to make very clear that similar issues are as relevant or even more relevant for other racial and ethnic uh, and uh, vulnerable populations across the U.S. We believe that this is information. It has been uh, a lot of consensus that this information and these strategies are also critical for eliminating health disparities, promoting health equity, and improving the nation's health. So I think that we have a great opportunity to continue expanding, enhancing the data collection to improve the health uh, of Hispanics and other minorities in the U.S., and the Hispanic Heritage Month is a good opportunity to remind us of these opportunities and uh, to continue advancing in these uh, uh, initiatives. I would like to stop here, and uh, I'm open for uh, any questions that the participants may have. Thank you very much again for participating. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for that insightful presentation. We will now move into the Q&A session. But first, I'd like to ask you all one more question. How will you use the information you obtained in this webinar?
thank you for your participation in the poll. Great. Okay, now let's move into the Q&A. And just as a reminder, you will remain on mute, so please use the chat box for questions. Okay. Okay. I know we had... Um like we have a question about okay. Thanks for that insightful presentation and many projects where I've collected race and ethnicity information. I have found it to be very challenging because many Hispanics don't identify with the categories that are available. Have you experienced that? Do you have any suggestions for how to improve the collection to better capture this information? Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very, very, very good question, and uh, and I agree. There is a lot of uh, many reports indicating that uh, Hispanics, particularly in general, the U.S. population, but particularly Hispanics, have a lot of problems in identifying with the currently available race, ethnic uh, uh, categories. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau uh, is at, the, at this time testing new ways of asking the question that seem to be have some good. Uh, uh, present some good opportunities. Uh, uh, we know that the majority of Hispanics prefer to be identified as Hispanic, uh, other country of origin, meaning Mexican or Salvadorian, versus uh, you know just Hispanic or uh, or Latino. Uh, still, this is the the best uh, standard that we have right now. Again, they have been tested, and there is continued continued efforts to to improve the way that we collect. Uh, this type of information from our population. They still there are very, very rough uh, ways to, to characterize or to disaggregate uh, the population that is the best that we, that we have. And still there is, I think, strong consensus that it's important to continue collecting this information. At the same time, it highlights, again, the importance of not only collecting Hispanic or Latino you know, minimum categories, but also collecting the detail subgroup information in other uh, diversity that elements like country of birth that can really help uh, much better uh, characterize this population and, and the participants can much better identify with these uh, different uh, race ethnic categories. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Next question. What is your approach and asking citizenship status to the Hispanic Latino population. Yeah, thanks again. This is an important, you know, important question too. Uh, the approach is, as I mentioned, is uh, is follow, and this is the general general recommendations is to follow or suggestions is to follow what the U.S. Census Bureau uses. Uh, the Census Bureau asks for, uh, are you a citizen of the U.S. or non-citizen? Uh, this is also, uh, you know, the, the type of information collected by other, uh, many other national surveys, like the National Health Interview Survey and other national surveys. So just differentiating, asking the, uh, the participants if they are U.S. citizens or uh, or not. Okay, thank you. Next question: um, How is Latino Hispanic defined? in the data that you went over on the cigarette smoking from the vital signs? If I remember well, that information comes from the BRFSS. And the BRFSS uses uh, similar, uh, similar uh, 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 definition than the one in terms of collecting the data similar to the one I mentioned to you in terms of the census. Uh, and this is also remind me that this is a very good question because even though the Office of Ma Management and Budget defines, uh, provide the definition that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's very important to remember that 
being Hispanic or Latino is based on self-identification. All of most of our data sources uh, collect information based on how the individual self-identifies, and that information is not corroborated or it's not based on any specific criteria, it's not based on language, it's not based on country of birth, it's just how the individual self-identifies. So basically, uh, in terms of who is Latino or not Latino in most of our data systems, is basically based on however the participant identified himself or herself. herself. Hello, um, this is Anna Penman Aguilar, and the data sources were actually um, the National Health Inter Interview Survey and, and Haynes for that, but all of what Dr. Rodriguez Lainz, um, his description was absolutely accurate in terms of how this was defined. There's a question from the audience about top coding, which is actually a term that I'm not familiar with, but um, uh, we were asked uh, if how top coding might have been employed. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Pamela Aguilar, for the clarification. You're right. I mean, most of, even though the, the exact way, the exact questions may vary from data system to data system, it's still the general categorization of Hispanic or no Latino, Hispanic or Latino, no Hispanic or, or Latino, and the specific uh, subgroups uh, tend to be similar to the one used by the census. Okay, let me repeat that question. How will we know and how could we measure that we are moving forward in this effort of getting better and right data to improve Latino health? Yeah, thank you. This is a very uh, important question too. And, and again, as I mentioned before, there have been these su suggestions and strategies and uh, uh, have been in place for, for a number of years. There have been many advances, but I agree that it would be great to be able to to, to document in the future, and maybe uh, you know how the systems are adapting to this uh, diversity, to the increased diversity of the Hispanic population. You know, maybe by next year or in the next uh, you know Hispanic Heritage Month, uh, we can report an additional uh, uh, enhancements and improvements, and additional data systems are incorporating some of these uh, strategies. I think that providing additional training about you know the needs, identifying the barriers by data systems, and, uh, and, and, and ways to address those barriers to incorporate these uh, suggested strategies also could be very important next uh, uh, next uh, next steps. But I think will be like I mentioned a few examples in, in this line in this slides in this presentation in upcoming years to to continue monitoring and reporting um, and, and enhancements that are taking place across federal agencies and how data is, collect, is collected. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. What is your opinion regarding Latino, the Latino-Hispanic paradox? How might current data collection practices influence or bias health indicators among Latino populations in the U.S.? Wow, that's a very, uh, very important, but also a very broad uh, question and, and also difficult to, uh, to answer. Uh, even though there is uh, quite a bit of evidence about the Hispanic uh, health paradox, uh, we are still not very clear about what is exact, what is exactly driving uh, this health advantage in, in spite of uh, many socio socioeconomic and disadvantages. Uh, and also it's very confusing because again varies by Hispanic groups and also varies by, by health uh, issues. In general, there are several 
factors that seem to be important for which there is relatively good evidence. One is uh, what is called the, the healthy immigrant uh, uh, factor, meaning that uh, immigrants, and specifically Hispanic immigrants coming to the U.S. tend to be young, healthy individuals in general with uh, uh, lower, uh, with better health than uh, U.S. You know, born populations, and even particularly when compared to the Hispanic U.S. born. So large numbers of you know Hispanic born individuals coming to the U.S. Uh, uh, with good health uh, affects uh, positively the health, the overall health of Hispanics in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, also, there is a lot of evidence that foreign born foreign born Hispanics have many protective factors, including you know strong family and social networks and also in terms of uh, maintaining many positive or healthy behaviors when they arrive to the U.S., at least for a number of years, even though there is some evidence that those behaviors, uh, positive behaviors, and, uh, uh, and also health outcomes tend to deteriorate o over time, again, varies by health issue. So both the health selection, the positive health selection of uh, foreign-born Hispanics and also those protective factors seem to be important drivers in <clears throat> explaining the healthy uh, Hispanic paradox. There might be also some possibilities of data collection uh, uh, difficulties. Uh, some population that might not be properly uh, included uh, in some biases in the, in, in the information on the statistics and in terms of both numerators and denominators can be driving some of these. But the evidence is uh, stronger for the healthy immigrant uh, factor and also for the protective factor uh, in terms of driving the, the Hispanic uh, advantage paradox. And sorry, the second question, I, in terms of measuring, uh, uh, there is uh, definitely by collecting uh, the diversity of element, data elements that were suggested in this presentation can help to, uh, to, to document some of those uh, potential factors. Uh, but there are many other in terms of, you know, not only individual, but also contextual factors in terms of where people live, um, the access to health care, policies, et cetera, that drives the health of Hispanics in, in the U.S. that also to be able to, to really understand uh, the, the, the Hispanic uh, health paradox uh, need to be taken into consideration. Thank you very much. And that concludes our Q&A. Um, the presentation will be posted on a website, and I'll put it into the chat box um, momentarily. And the presentation will be posted this afternoon. Um, if we weren't able to get to your question, please email omhhe at cdc.gov, and we will be able to get back to you that way. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Leander Slaber, Director of CDC's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, for concluding remarks. Thanks, Jenny, and thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for the excellent presentation. And thank you all, all of the participants, for the engaging um, question and answers. Um, during Hispanic Heritage Month, we celebrate the many generations of Hispanics that have enriched our country. Today, we got a deeper look into the complexity of data collection for Hispanic and Latino populations. As the Hispanic population continues to grow, it remains essential that we examine the topics shared by Dr. Rodriguez. This presentation reinforces the need for collecting, analyzing, and reporting on standardized Hispanic diversity variables and promoting culturally appropriate data collection. Expanding data collection is an imperative activity that will help us achieve health equity. So on behalf of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, I would like to thank all of the attendees of today's webinar. And again, a special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Rodriguez Lanes. A reminder that a recording of our webinar will be available on CDC's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity website in just a few weeks. Please feel free to share with colleagues and others. Thank you and have a great day. <laughs>